Okay, so hello everyone. My name is Kat or Kathleen Saraza. They can call me either, and I am the event coordinator for Crime Busters. Welcome to the event coach training, and I will share my presentation and we'll get started. Okay, so the format of this presentation, this uh, training session will be that there are intervals of um, when I will ask if anyone has questions, but if anyone has questions, John will be monitoring both the chat and just the raise hand function. So if you have a question at any time, please don't hesitate to use either of those functions. For now, we'll get started though. So as I said before, this is the Crime Busters event, event coach training for this year. And I'll give a brief introduction to Crime Busters. Basically, there is a fictional crime scene that the students uh, are studying as part of a forensic unit. And the objective of the Crime Busters event is to determine who committed the crime using various evidences found at the crime scene. So this year, the official tournament will be Saturday, May 11th, 2024. And uh, this event usually has one or two students as a team. And the amount of time allotted for this event is 30 minutes in which they can use evidence to figure out who has uh, committed a fictional crime. And there are many different types of evidence that they can work with. There are six parts which consist of six different types of evidence. Part one is going to be powders. So part one will be powders. Part two will be ink samples. Parts three through five are prints. And part six um, is unspecified evidence. And we will go through each of these kinds of evidence in detail throughout this presentation. And there are five suspects uh, that the students can choose from. Keep in mind that the students can implicate one or two suspects after looking at all the evidence. Here is a list of given materials for this event. There are a list of possible powders as well as the powders themselves. There will also be tap water, vinegar, and iodine solution plastic cups, wooden spoons and toothpicks, black paper, a chromatogram with the ink samples and rubbing alcohol, a prints packet, and an exam sheet in zip grade form. The exam sheet uh, looks like this, where it will be a double-sided sheet of paper, and the students uh, should fill out their school name, their team number, and their names for identification purposes when grading. They will also receive a zip grade form where luckily it is pre-labeled by the event organizers, so it will have their school name, uh, the event name, uh, what tournament they're at, whether it's a practice tournament or the actual tournament, and their team number. So this is an example of uh, what they would fill out on the exam sheet. They would fill out the powder identification table and the tiebreaker questions. I highly recommend they fill out the tiebreaker questions because it breaks any ties in the event that uh, they do tie with another team. But the purpose of this slide is to just make sure that your students are aware that they fill out both of these portions. This is graded. This is optional because um, I've had students lose points in the past because they actually haven't fully filled out the table or they haven't filled out the table at all. So just please communicate that with your students. And then these questions on the second sheet of the exam sheets will be answered through the zip grade. It's numbered one through seven, and then it corresponds to the numbered bubble rows on the zip grade sheet. Also, make sure that the answers to these questions make it onto the zip grade sheet 
make sure you communicate that with your students because I've also seen that some students will write the letter answer here, but it needs to make it onto the zip grade to officially be graded. The test is out of 100 points and unanswered questions are automatically marked wrong. The exception to this is the tiebreaker because uh, it doesn't count towards them. It just helps them if they have time to finish. And if two teams correctly answer all tiebreaker questions after trying to break the tie, then their chromatogram quality will determine um, the tiebreaker. So. Uh, we'll get into greater detail on how to uh, make a great chromatogram in this presentation. So there are a few items that the students are responsible for bringing. First and foremost, they need goggles, one for each student if the team consists of two students, because safety is number one in my event, as well as Science Olympiad in general. We want to make sure that they're safe, and I will communicate uh, the importance of goggles and general safety to the students at the beginning of every event, whether it's a practice tournament or the actual tournament. Also, uh, they should bring pencils, these are quite important. I will have some on hand, but uh, they shouldn't count on it always because uh, I might run out if I have extra stock, but multiple um, teams need. So just make sure they are stocked with pencils. They are allowed one sheet or one index card double sided. And this sheet um, will be 8.5 by 11 inches. They can write notes on there. It can either be handwritten or it can be typed out. It just has to fit within the size parameters. The index card will be a three by five, whereas the sheet will be 8.5 by 11. As long as they don't exceed the 8.5 by 11 inch note sheet, they are fine. And also it has to be just with in that sheet. So no sticky notes on that sheet that have additional information written on it. If I find or one of my volunteers finds that they have multiple sheets or um, they have sticky notes on there, then uh, we will let them know and um, we'll go from there. Most likely for practices, it's highly frowned upon, but I will let them use it during there in case um, they have more than one sheet before the official tournament. I will not allow anything besides uh, note sheets that fit within this parameter. So please keep that in mind. Also with the magnifying glasses, uh, you can bring one magnifying glass between the two students and this will help them throughout the section. I may have extras, but don't count on it. The students should also remember their team number. Um, if they know their elementary school, uh, elementary school name, but if they know their number, that will greatly help us with seating the students at the proper station since the stations are sorted out by team number and name it's easier to find team number so make sure they remember that and then masks are optional for this event so now we'll move on to the powder section of uh, what they'll study for the evidence of the fictional crime scene and the objective of the powder section is to identify each powder and uh, match the evidence uh, powder cup, which is labeled as cup one, two, one, or more of the uh, powder cups that are labeled A through E. A through E corresponds to each suspect. So uh, suspect A will have powder cup A, so on and so forth. There can be up to three powders in a cup. So please keep this in mind when practicing and um, when the students go to the tournaments. And they are given multiple supplies to help determine what powders are in each cup. So that's where the black paper, uh, water, vinegar, iodine, paper, uh, plastic cups, and toothpicks and spoons come in handy. And 
the liquids will be in squeezy bottles, so they can uh, put small drops onto powder samples. If they need any extra uh, of any of these items in the bottom row, they can get extra, but they can not get extra powders. So what is set up at the station when they get there for the powders is what they get. So my recommendation is that they um, use small portions of powder from each cup when studying using these materials. So um, like I said before, uh, use small portions of any specific powder cup to study. I recommend using a wooden spoon to scoop out a small portion of powder. Then they can either use the black paper or the plastic cup, uh, put the small portion of powder in there, and then they can use the other materials to study. Um, they want to uh, perhaps have one person study the powders while the other a person within the team will go on to different test materials, different evidence to study. So that's up to you to decide or the students to decide how they want to divvy that up. But the resources are here for them to determine what powder or powders are within the cup. Also, the magnifying glass will be useful in this section. So please make sure to bring one. There are 10 different kinds of powders in this event, baking soda, calcium carbonate, cornstarch, flour, gelatin, granulated sugar, salt, white cornmeal, yeast, and Alka-Seltzer. There are combinations that will never be allowed in this event since the combination of these specific powders would prove to be too difficult to um, discern from one another. So the first combination that will not be allowed is Alka-Seltzer, baking soda, and or calcium carbonate. So these won't be combined in any combination. And also cornstarch and flour will not be combined together. So um, keep this in mind when you are practicing with your students. For actually answering uh, the questions in the exam sheet and the zip grade, on the exam sheet, they need to fill out the, ident the identity of each powder cup, whatever powders are in each cup, by circling whichever powders are in cup one, cup two, uh, cup A, I mean, so on and so forth. And then for the zip grade questions, they will be answering question one, which suspects or suspects powders match cup one, and they will bubble in the answer as number one in the zip grade sheet. This is how they have the chance of uh, getting full points since they answered uh, both the exam sheet and the zip grade. If they miss either one, then they automatically lose out on some points. So are there any questions on powders? Stacey, I'm going to ask you go, to go ahead and turn off your camera. Thank you. We're good. Thank you. Okay. So in that case, we'll move on to chromatography with the ink samples. So Basically, chromatography is the uh, science of separating a material into its ingredients that make up the whole material. So in this case, um, they'll use chromatography to separate out the different uh, ingredients that make up the ink that are on the uh, chromatogram to determine whose ink pattern in lane two matches uh, matches the suspects. So ink sample two is the evidence found at the crime scene. And then uh, inks A through E are the suspects ink samples given. There are no extra chromatograms given. So they only get one that's uh, placed in their station when they first get there. So uh, make sure they know that and that they uh, do their best to uh, 
conduct chromat chromatography on this um, chromatogram. And this chromatogram will be turned in with the exam sheets at the end of the session. I'll explain how these lanes or colored lines uh, show up on the chromatogram. So the process of uh, separating a material into the ingredients that make up the whole material uh, is facilitated through using an eluent or a liquid that will have uh, capillary action um, carry the different ingredients of each ink up the chromatography paper. The chromatography paper is absorbent. It's not your average paper. It's cotton-based, so it won't fall apart easily when making contact with the rubbing alcohol. Uh, to put the chromatogram in the rubbing alcohol, they will use one of their pencils to gently push a hole through the chromatogram, there will be a hole punch, but they do have to um, push the pencil through the hole punch just to make sure that it's in the center of the pencil. After they make sure that the chromatogram is at the center of the pencil and it's completely 90 degrees to the pencil or perpendicular, then they will lower the chromatography paper into the cup or the chromatogram into the cup make sure that the ink lines on the chromatogram are above the rubbing alcohol level. So if the rubbing alcohol level is above where the ink lines are, then their chromatography will not work at all. The inks will just dissolve into the rubbing alcohol and the rubbing alcohol will turn whatever colors of ink are on the chromatogram. So when you practice this with your students. Make sure that the rubbing alcohol level in the cup, we use plastic cups, are below the level of the um, of ink marked on the chromatogram and adjust as needed. So you can add more or take out uh, rubbing alcohol to facilitate this. Once you have the chromatogram in the rubbing alcohol, you'll see slowly that the ink will rise. And if you have the chromatogram completely perpendicular to the pencil, then you'll see that uh, they'll all rise at the same uh, level. If it's crooked on the pencil, you'll see that the lines may slope one way or the other. That's how you know that the chromatogram isn't as good. You're going to wait about 10 minutes uh, to have the ink travel up through the chromatography paper, but monitor the paper closely and don't move the pencil with the paper or the cup, any of those, as you're uh, waiting that 10 minutes. It may be a bit more, it may be a bit less. You don't want uh, the uh, lanes or the ink lines to go past the label of the um, 2 A, B, C, D, E. So 10 minutes is usually a good time to leave the chromatography paper in. After the 10-ish minutes, you will gently take the pencil out of the cup and let the chromatography paper dry on the side. And we grade the chromatography paper based on if there are straight, clean lanes and separation of ink per lane. So generally with this example, uh, the levels of the ink are about the same. Again, if we see, let's say E, the um, level is a lot lower than the rest of them, then that they would be docked points for that since um, it's not as uh, straight and clean as it could be. So once they finish their uh, chromatogram, there are no portions that they have to fill out on the exam sheets but they do have to fill out the um, exam question number two on the zip grade, and they have to turn in the chromatogram for a chance at full points. And let me just uh, drive one point home. So when we look at the different lanes versus before we put the chromatography paper in the rubbing alcohol, we see that even though the uh, ink samples are black, 
you'll see that there might be some different colors that actually show up once they do the chromatography. So in this case, lane two would most closely match B. And your students, it's best if you do multiple tests with different kinds of pens to see the differences and uh, what's separated through black ink, because you'll see sometimes there are uh, purple components. It might be straight black ink, it might be darker blue, some greens, light blue, any combination of that. So keep that in mind when practicing and when they're doing the exams, they want to match the lane and two to whichever suspect or suspects have the same similar um, color profile. So are there any questions about chromatography? Kathleen, we have a question in the chat. Um, sure. Uh, a coach would like to know if the students will be adding the rubbing alcohol to the cups or whether okay. we'll be doing that for them. So we'll be doing that for them. And I will have um, a level that I will let my volunteers know on the cup that they should fill to. If the students find that the rubbing alcohol isn't enough to actually submerge the paper slightly, or if it's too much, then they can raise their hand and myself or one of the volunteers will adjust the level of rubbing alcohol accordingly. But this will be done before they even enter the room. They find out that it's too much and they've already dipped the chromatogram in the alcohol. What happens at that point? So if they dip it in and they see that it's too high, then they should take it out immediately um, to prevent ink loss. And then they will raise their hand and uh, someone will help them adjust the levels. But they should do their best to estimate if before they dip the paper into the rubbing alcohol, whether or not it's going to um, be above the ink levels on the chromatography paper. We want to avoid them dipping and then it goes past the ink lines and then ink's already starting to dissolve into the rubbing alcohol. You'll see it when you dip it in. If it's above, the um, black ink will start swirling into the rubbing alcohol. So that's one immediate sign that they should lift it out and then let someone know so that uh, it can be replaced the alcohol, not the chromatogram. We have a couple more questions. They're asking what strength of rubbing alcohol? As to so, what percentage, I believe. So usually in the past, before COVID, we tried to keep it at 70% alcohol, but especially when stocks were very limited, I just found whatever I could. This year, though, um, I plan to use only 70% rubbing alcohol because the stores are uh, more consistent with stocking. In either case, though, um, both will do the same thing. 91% uh, uh, alcohol may have the process do it faster, but in this case, I'll just choose 70% because um, that's what we've done in the past. If you can't find 70%, 91% is fine, but just for consistency across tournaments, since we can now, it'll be 70%. Is it a clear cup? So um, clear cuts, I'm not sure if the uh, question can be the elaborated. Cup, the, the cup oh. that, the, that the paper is dipped into, or the alcohol's in. Is it clear? Clear cup. Yes, it's going to be clear. Uh, Jill, I'm not sure I understand your question. It says black in only needs to be studied, and I don't know what that means. I think so she meant uh, black ink. She's asking, I think, if black ink is the only ink that's going to be studied. Oh, good question. Um. I'd recommend using different colored inks because um, it's not restricted to just black. 
may be one tournament, it may be multiple colors, or it might be all black. So I'd recommend using different colors, plus that gives you more practice to see how uh, the ink separates out as uh, the rubbing alcohol goes through the chromatogram. Another question is, is the hole punch already made in the paper? Yes, so the hole punch is made in the paper and um, it'll be between B and C. Um, and I make these chroma chromatograms in a sense that the hole punch will be just about down the center of the chromatography paper. I have a just a comment for the group as a whole. Uh, this presentation is already posted on our website, and this video that's being recorded will also be posted on our website in the next day or so. So I'm watching Stacy taking photographs of the of the image. Stacy, if you want to go ahead and turn off your camera, uh, that would be great. Uh, but so everyone, uh, you don't have to try to take images of what Kathleen is presenting here. She's done a great job, and we already have it posted on our website. Uh, we Oh, Stacy asked a question. Will okay. it be ballpoint pen or other types of pen, like flare markers? It can be any type of pen, so it's not restricted just to ballpoint. Those are the questions in the chat. Uh, let's see, we might have a hand raised. Uh, Penny, uh, you have your hand raised. If you wanna unmute and ask your question. Hi, yes, I'm sorry. I was just wondering about, um, you had mentioned about they were gonna be timed. Do the kids watch the clock or does somebody, do they hit a timer or? So students will not be permitted a timer like that they bring in, but there will be clocks posted. And if by chance the clocks aren't accurate or there are no clocks, then I will provide warnings every 5, 10, 15, incremental warnings uh, to let them know how far they are in the event. Okay, great, thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions? Shaw has a question. Yes, um, so I'm trying to understand, never done this before, so um, this chromatography, this this piece of paper, mm -hmm. it will be given to the student with the hole punched into it, and someone from your team will pour the rubbing alcohol in the clear cup. Isn't it, how about the person who's pouring it, they poured it too much, then our 10 year olds dip it in and it goes too much far down, and they raise their hand, they lose time to get another cup or another chromatogram. So I was just wondering, is there any 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 mark in the clear cup? So this is where the rubbing alcohol should be. So before, when we set up this session, this uh, event for each tournament, I will notify my volunteers of where they should fill the cup because I will test this myself with the mm -hmm. cup, the exact cup, the rubbing alcohol, I'll make a chromatogram just for the test to determine where the levels will be. So I'll let them know and um, I will train them on how to fill the cups, but sometimes that will happen. And in this case, they still just raise their hand. Uh, we'll do our best to make sure that the cups are at a consistent level and that the chromatograms are um, standardized. So in that case, we'll try and avoid this. Also, there are cases where students just prefer a little more alcohol versus the other, which is why we still give that option. And if by chance the alcohol level is too high, then we'll adjust for that. The benefits of the chromatography section is that since it takes 12 minutes out of the 30 minutes, and if you have your students um, divide and conquer, then one student will uh, be responsible for this and there shouldn't be too much time lost since uh, if you divide and conquer, there would be, um, let's say the students resources as in like their 
ability, their um, test taking will not be diverted too much if one person focuses on chromatography first and then jumps in later to other parts of the exam. Does that make sense? Yes. Um, the the ink mm -hmm. that, you, that we were talking about, who puts the ink on the chromatography? Paper. So I do. <laughs> okay. I will make all these chromatograms prior to the practice exams and practice tournaments as well as the actual tournament. So yeah, I have a method to uh, make these as standardized as possible. So yeah. We have another question. They're asking, will there be an extra piece of chromatography paper if the kids want to do it twice? No, only one for tournaments. Per team. Stacy's making a comment, says our students said this should be one of the first components that's done so you don't end up short on time. It sounds like good advice. <laughs> we have about 15 minutes left, Kathleen. I know you have a lot of material. So, so a lot of great, a lot of great questions. And we'll get rolling too on uh, the rest of this presentation. So we're going to move on to the prints portion of uh, the exam where they are given pictures of fingerprints, footprints, entire prints, and it'll be split up so that um, there will be uh, fingerprints or any type of prints of the suspect in one area. And then in other uh, areas in the packet, there will be the prints of the suspects A through E. Keep in mind that there may be partial prints and obscured prints uh, that can show up in the prints packets. And but what I mean by prints packet is there will just be sheets of paper stapled together with the pictures of the different kinds of prints. So the objective is to look at the prints of uh, pro of uh, parts three, four, and five and match it to the uh, prints of the appropriate suspect or suspects. I highly recommend using the magnifying glass because that's where they can uh, see finite similarities and differences between the evidence found at the crime scene and the prints provided by the suspects. And for uh, answering the questions on paper, they will answer questions three through five on the zip grade form questions on the zip grade form. They'll bubble in their answers and they must answer all three of these questions corresponding to the different prints. Any questions about the prints portion? Okay. And then part six, this is the unspecified evidence. And for every tournament, there will be uh, unspecified evidence that will be different every year. So examples of this can be, but are not limited to hair strands, handwriting samples, pH tests, um, and it can go on from there. This varies year to year. And in this case, I would use like out of the box thinking to try and think of uh, what would possibly show up for an elementary school crime busters um, unspecified evidence portion in an event. So this is where you could brainstorm with your students, uh, try and see like what could show up and then generally uh, just have them prepared to, for the unknown because um, it'll create uh, more critical thinking skills and this is just a good way to I guess have a little fun with this um, event too. And on the zip grade form, they should answer, they should bubble in whatever um, suspects evidence match the unspecified evidence sample six on the zip grade form. And that's the only portion in which they have to answer for unspecified evidence. Are there any questions about unspecified evidence? Okay. 
Okay. Uh, we do have a question. Oh, sure. Um, let's see here. Adam says, for the print element, are they made from ink samples or are are they using tape and powders? So this is for prints. So the print samples, they'll be printed onto paper for um, fingerprints. My samples were uh, collected using the old finger onto ink pad and then put it on paper. With the tape elements, we wouldn't go that far because that is used in forensic uh, studies or forensic crime scenes. But for these purposes, we'll just use a good old ink pad onto paper. And for the footprints and tire prints, um, they're usually pictures of sorts that are modified to uh, take off any residual background so that only the print is there. But that's a good question. We have another question. It says on, in the powders category, can they use toothpicks to investigate? Yep, they can use toothpicks to move the powder around if they're looking with their magnifying glass or if they want to, uh, let's say, add a few drops of water, mix it, mix the powder and the water together to see if like any reaction happens, they're more than welcome to. And they can ask for more of toothpicks if they'd like. Xavier has a question. Xavier, you'll have to un unmute your microphone to ask it. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to do that. Okay. Uh, Shaw, you have a question? Uh, yes, I do. So these are the evidence, uh, powder, ink, uh, hair strands. How are they collected? I mean, so how, how is the powder connected to the powder collected from the suspects? How the the ink collected from the from the suspects or can you put that tie together and okay. how they're connected? So the context of this um, event is that I'll use like a past example of a test. So for instance, there was a tulip festival in Holland and um, this is all fictional, right? I just write stories that uh, are fun for the students to give context to the evidence. So let's say um, officials found at the crime scene that someone stole all the tulips for tulip time in Holland and they left behind like different powders or footprints and whatnot. So theoretically, officials would gather the evidence found at the crime scene, uh, give it to the forensic unit, which is your students, and then they're also giving um, samples of evidence from these theoretical suspects. So uh, it would all be compiled into what they would find at the station at the event. Did that help you, Shaw? Because you want to compare the um, samples of the suspects to what was found at the crime scene, because that's how you can figure out how to go further in your uh, theoretical investigation. Right, yes. Thank okay, you. yeah, you're welcome. We have, we have another question in regards to the uh, follow on to the toothpick question of earlier. So you, that will the toothpicks be provided or are the students supposed to bring them? The toothpicks will be provided. So if we go back. Everything you see on this slide will be provided to students prior to them walking in. So every station corresponding to each team will have the same items plus the exam uh, sheets. And they'll also be giving their given their own chromatogram as well and rubbing alcohol. 
I recommend bringing extra pencils though for the chromatography since if they're both going to be writing, they should have at least one extra pencil, which they're allowed to bring. We have another question. It says concerning the pH papers as your example, how is that used? I'm asking as pH paper have range between one to 14 and have a color component from what have been tested. So the students would have to understand if there's a color range depending on the pH of the items tested. So if pH was given a particular event, like a particular tournament, then there would be instructions and a key that would uh, show them like, okay, so if it's a pH of one, it's going to be a really red in color. If it's pH three, this color, so on and so forth. I'll give them the um, information that they need to answer the question based on what the unspecified evidence is. I okay. think in the interest of time, we should move on to criminal identification. John, is there any wiggle room in the time where we have to end at 45? We have to end at 50. 50, okay. So we'll go through um, the rest of this presentation. It's going to be a few more slides, but some of them are shorter. This is the most important part of the um, test, which is actually identifying the criminal or criminals based on evidence. And you use the number of times the suspect was chosen in the zip grade answers as uh, your answer for number seven. There can be one or two um, suspects implicated. So in this case, you would answer this question on the zip grade. In this example, if we look at the answers given on the zip grade leading up to number seven, in this case, you would choose both A and C as your final answer. So you'd bubble in A and C because they both show up twice, meaning that both of them, um, in this case, did do the crime. And like I said, they just answer, the box should be on number seven, not number six, based on all the evidence who committed the crime. And um, this was the example I was alluding to earlier. If you have two suspects that both show up the same amount of times, you would implicate them both. For example, one. For example, two, if you find that one suspect, in this case A, was implicated twice and suspect C was implicated three times, you'd only choose C because uh, suspect C appeared the most. If you see, uh, in this case, that suspect B was implicated the most with three times, suspect D only two times, you'd only answer B. So keep that in mind when practicing with your students. And the tiebreaker questions are provided and it's in their best interest to answer these questions if there's time. Um, if two teams, like I said before, correctly answer all tiebreaker questions when trying to break a tie, then their chromatography will, uh, quality will determine the tiebreaker. When they're finished, um, they should make sure that all questions are answered, especially the tiebreaker. We'll also check to make sure if there's time and we'll let them know, hey, you have some time, you can answer the tiebreaker if you'd like. Um, if they finish early, they can raise their hand and they'll turn in the zip grade form, the exam sheet and their chromatogram. They will be provided with a label that states their school name and their team number. They'll place that on the back of the chromatogram. So where there's no ink lanes or samples, if they finish at the 30 minute mark, then me and my volunteers will collect the materials. Here's some final notes. So you should check out my Crime Busters website graciously made by the organization. There's a lot of good information on there. Please practice, practice, practice with your students because that's how they'll get really good at this event. Um, so hands on practice is good. Talking with them, making sure they understand the different uh, evidences and different parts of the exam and practice splitting up portions between partners to maximize time. 
I'll make sure that the students have all the materials they need before the tournament and uh, use the note sheet to the students advantage. Most importantly, have fun. This is how they learn about science, how they figure out what they're interested in. Um, you can find the district practice tournament uh, dates on the Science Olympiad websites. I'll be at all those practice tournaments. There are quick start kits and uh, based on what you'd like, you can get uh, the quick start kit or replenishment kits online. You can also purchase chromatography paper or a magnifier using um, this link in the PowerPoint. It's also found on my um, event website if you're interested. And are there any more questions? Uh, we do have one more question where it says, do the students move from station to station or will they be working only at one table? They'll only be working at one table in their own station. I have a question for you. Are all sure. the sections of the uh, test worth the same amount of points? No, each section is worth a different amount of points. So, um, yeah. Uh, we have a question, how many suspects will there be? And I think you covered that, but you could repeat that. So there are five suspects that you can choose from. You can implicate one suspect or two when answering question seven of who did the crime. Penny ha has a question if she wants to unmute and ask. Hi, yes, I was just wondering, do, can, is there a way to get a sample of the um, the test paper actually where they have to circle in the things and stuff to have them practice doing that? If the so kids there, haven't done it. So there are some um, like example sheets on the Crime Busters website that you can find. Okay. okay. Mm -hmm. Let's see, I think another. Um, so there, I asked the question about points. They're saying, can you give us the point breakout by question? Can you give an approximate? Because I don't think it's always exactly the same. Better if I go back to here. So powder identification, you can count on that being uh, more points in the total 100. For the chromatography, yeah, I'm going to say that powder identification will be one of the sections with more points. Also, the last question, based on all the evidence, who committed the crime, that will also count for a good portion of uh, points. As for the others, they will be um, split based on difficulty of the questions being asked. So. Uh, that's what I can say about the question breakup. So we have uh, one more question and then I'm, which I'm going to answer and then we're going to wrap it up. Sure. Uh, it says, what's a good email if we have more questions when we do the practice? So uh, we do not give out our supervisors email addresses, uh, uh, but there is an FAQ system on our website. So if you have questions for clarifications about the rules, uh, you can do that. Our, our event supervisors are not available after today for coaching of coaching of you, but go ahead and ask questions. So don't be shy. Um, so if you have questions after today, that's the best way to go. So Kathleen, unfortunately, even though you're so <laughs> popular, we have to wrap it up. Yep. So in that case, I'll stop presenting and I hope everyone had a very good time learning about Crime Busters. The website is there for you as well as the FAQs and have fun practicing. Make sure you use the resources you have available, including that uh, startup kits. I hope everyone has a good day. Thank you for coming and I will see you and your students at the tournaments throughout the year. Thank you. Bye.